All right, we are in a series of messages. We're talking about the eight days that changed the world, and it's that week that includes all the Holy Week. And so here's what, here's what we talked about last week. Last week, we were on Tuesday of that week. And on Tuesday, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and it's a, it's a crazy day. He's under attack all day long. And so we looked at several different examples. All of Jesus' enemies were taking shots at him to see if they could undo him, unravel him, see if they could stir him up in some way that would, that would lead to his destruction. Where, where can we catch him in the middle of things? And so, as they are attacking, can we tra- trap him? Can we trick him? Can we sidetrack him? Here's the thing. Jesus was never distracted from his mission. He was never pulled off sides. He, he, he was never... He was never without focus, but Tuesday was a long day of challenges. He felt like a, had to feel at the end of this day like he's a punching bag. He's just been brutalized all day long on Tuesday of that week. And uh, any of you ever have have a week like that? Where you just feel like, oh man, every time I turn around, somebody's taking a shot. Somebody's trying to undo me, unravel me, and I'm just worn out by the, by the experience of it all Everyone in everyone's crosshairs. We're told that Jesus spent Tuesday of that week in Jerusalem. But when it starts getting late in the day, he did what he did often. He didn't usually stay in Jerusalem. He left Jerusalem. He, the temple complex, right on the eastern edge of the city, and he leaves the temple complex through the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives. And on the other side of the Mount of Olives, you, you go over the crest of the Mount of Olives down there's some villages and one of those villages is a little village called Bethany and he has some really good friends there and so what we find is that at night he made his way to Bethany and that's what he did on Tuesday and then usually he'd spend the night and make this about a two mile walk back to the temple complex on that side of Jerusalem but on this occasion he didn't go back Wednesday he stayed in Bethany And so that's our focus uh, for today, and we're going to talk about a little bit about what Jesus would have done on that day. Now, uh, the story that I want to read to you from Matthew 26, beginning in verse 6, and we talked about this last week a little bit, chronologically, the Gospels are not chronological books. They each have a different focus, they each have a different audience, they tell a different story, and so you wrap them all together and you try to figure out, okay, what happened Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Easter Sunday. So what happened each of those days? This story, we believe, happened about a week before the Wednesday we're talking about, but at the same house, and this is how the Bible tells it. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, always one of my favorite phrases in the Bible, Simon the leper, probably just hadn't had a chance to change the sign on the mailbox yet. Simon the leper. Well, we, we did gospel training uh, yesterday, and it's always fun to, to hear people doing their 15-second testimony. You know, how can you, how can you turn any conversation into a gospel conversation? Well, you just need something to flip that conversation. 15-second testimony is the easy way to do that. So think about Simon. This is 15-second testimony. You know, there was a time in my life when I was Simon the leper. And then I, I met Jesus. I came to know his forgiveness. I surrendered my life to him. And now I'm changing the sign of the mailbox. Because that's what happens when Jesus comes around your identity becomes all new when Jesus is in your life. Do you have a story like that? That's Simon's story. Simon, it says, the leper. It says a woman approached him. Uh, as we compare the Gospels, we find out this is Mary. Mary of Mary and her sister Martha and brother Lazarus. Mary approached him with an alabaster jar, very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. One of the other gospels says Judas led that charge. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor, the criticism comes. Aware of this, Jesus said, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. 
By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be also told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out 30 pieces of silver for him. And from that time, he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. So this Wednesday of Holy Week is sometimes called Silent Wednesday because the Gospels don't record any activity of Jesus on this day. It's not like, and then Jesus taught this, and Jesus healed this person, and Jesus, we don't have any of that information. Jesus appears to have taken uh, a day off from everything that he had been doing and the way he had been doing things. We know that Judas is still active. Some of some tangible activity some he's just thinking through his plan of how this is going to work we know Jesus enemies are active formulating meeting how can we capture him the next opportunity we have how can we destroy him however from what we know of the nature the character the person of Jesus the Christ what do you think he did on Wednesday well did he just take a long nap it probably wouldn't have hurt but I don't know, it doesn't seem too likely in this particular setting. He binge-watched Netflix for the day to relieve some stress? Probably not. Don't see that as a part of who Jesus would be, what Jesus would be about. Jesus saw every day as a gift from God. And I really think, you think about, okay, so this is Wednesday, silent Wednesday. Thursday and Friday, going to be tough days. Jesus would die on the cross on Friday for the sins of the world and I think this is a day of preparation and based on what we know of the character of Christ it's a day of prayer we know he was with friends Uh, community fellowship with those he loved were vital to Jesus He, he regularly community was important it has to be important to us too we follow his example so we see that in how Jesus did things so we've got Simon the leper. We believe from context clues he was married to Martha of Mary and Martha. Mary, she's the one that anoints him with very expensive oil. It's worth almost a year's wages. It was a huge, extravagant expression of love for Jesus whom she loved so much. Jesus who had done so much in her family because not only has he changed her life, Not only has he changed Simon's life, Martha's transformed. But then there's there's Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, who wasn't but just a few days before all this takes place that he was dead. So when you get to a table to have a meal on Wednesday, it's just kind of crazy that, okay, so look at all God's done. Oh, yeah, and Lazarus isn't dead anymore. That's a pretty big deal. And one thing to not have leprosy anymore, and I, well, he's, he's mostly alive today. That's good. Because that's the difference Jesus makes. When Jesus enters a family, enters a circumstance, enters a need, things start to shift and things start to change. And he was, he was, he was in this group of people that they had embraced him, the Messiah. They had embraced the message the good news he was sharing, they embraced the mission that he was about. And we know Jesus' commitment to prayer, communion with his Father in heaven. And and when Jesus prayed, he prayed about big things. Um, Not just, you know, dear God, help us to get back to Jerusalem safely tomorrow. He was praying kingdom-focused prayers, eternity-shaking prayers, soul bearing prayers and listen prayer changes things prayer strengthens us prayer invites the all the resources of almighty god into into our lives into the lives of the people we lift up in prayer and that power and that grace and that wisdom and and all those things that uh when we're praying we say wow this is a really big thing when you lay it out before god God doesn't see too many things of ours that are big things, I'm thinking. Everything gets right-sized with God. But he's a part of the big, sweeping, eternal, change-the-world things. He's also heavily involved in just day-to-day stuff. He cares about the details, too. 
So here we are in this place of worship, and it's a pretty quiet place in the middle of a noisy world. And we're in a, certainly in a season in our country where it's just a lot of people seem like are yelling at each other about a lot of stuff. And uh, there are people on the news and in the news, and everything's a debate, and everything is tense, and arguments about culture and about politics and opinions, and there's a lot of biblical things wrapped around all that. And I'm kind of grateful for Sundays uh, when you, this last week's been a wild week in our country, and in all kinds of ways, and in the world. And I'm just grateful I can come here, and it's a quiet place. And it's a spiritual place. It's a place where we gather in community with people we love. And that does not mean we didn't come in here feeling more than a little bit battered by it all, right? Because we live in a broken world, too. And I feel it. A lot of you feel it. Even if you're right in the middle of God's will doing what you should do, sometimes because we live in a broken world, it's sin-stained, poisoned. Some of that gets on us. Some of it falls on us. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough world. And so our challenge today is to pray. I'm not going to preach a sermon about how to pray We've done lots of those kind of sermons where we pray, we, we, you know, do our teaching in here is on, okay, here's how to pray the things that are important in the Lord's Prayer. Here's how to pray uh, the prayers of Paul from his letters, which are wonderful ways to pr pray Scripture back to God. That's a wonderful way to pray. And we give a lot of principles about prayer, but I think a lot of people, including a lot of believers, we, we talk about prayer, we intend prayer. The one thing that we never get around to doing is to actually to pray. And so that's what we're going to try to do today. So in your program, you found a prayer guide, and you see these numbers. There are prayer stations around the building. And th there are several things you want to accomplish in this. By the way, we were uh, talking about this earlier, just how the bulb is sitting, I think. But this sconce over here, number five, it's overwhelmingly the brightest station we have. It's on sin. So you guys enjoy that one. We have spotlighted you over there on the sin uh, station. Uh, but, you know, the, the light drives out the darkness. So there we go. It may, it may do you some good. Here's, uh, here's what we're doing. We're going we're gonna to turn you loose in a moment to, to walk around to these different places and to pray. This prayer guide... We wanted to encourage a different level of praying maybe than we've done a, a lot of times. How often do we say, okay, we have a burden. We, we have missionary. We have missionaries directly associated with our church that we, we do, do direct support with. And, uh, and, we have, and how do we pray for missionaries? Dear God, bless the missionaries. Bless the missionaries. We can, we can pray better than that, but sometimes we are talking to some people after the first service. I've just never known how to pray for the missionaries before. We know that persecution is extreme in, in, in our world. People are dying. Uh, a lot of people dying for the cause of Christ. A bunch of people died in uh, the north, northeastern Kenya. Uh, university students, they just... Terrorists singled them out and shot them because they were Christians. Uh, what, week before last. Uh, there's a lot of persecution. How do you pray for the persecuted church? Dear God, help the persecuted church. We can pray more specific things than that. So th this prayer guide isn't everything about everything, but it may give you some prayer prompts that are a little different than what you've had before. We wanted to be sure you had this in your hands so you could take it with you. Now, in these prayer stations, there, there are a lot of different things, but here's what we've tried to do is to put things together so that when you go to one of these spots, there's something you do. There are people I know who are far from God, who are spiritually lost. And, and so what we have here, and people just written names, some multiple names, some individual names, just first names. They put them on this cross to say, as a tangible expression, I'm praying for this person, that they'll come to know Christ, or they'll come back to Christ. And we're going to put it on the cross. So there's something you do. Next steps. Is, what are my next steps? How to do? There's a bookmark that you take with you to encourage continuing processing of that. 
uh, oh goodness, the persecuted church, there's, there's something you take. So sometimes you take something, sometimes you leave something. Uh, there, there's a place over here for praying for our sister churches. And there's just churches around our area that we have a close relationship with for any number of different reasons. You know, you want to pray for our friends uh, at Cottonwood Creek Baptist Church today. Uh, Cottonwood got slammed by that storm last Sunday and their roof came down and they, they lost, they're having to redo their children in preschool area in a big way. And man, that is rotten. And uh, they're all together in worship and they're, they're, you know, they're pressing on today, but we need to pray for them, uh, you know, trying to get a contractor in and get big stuff fixed and Easter coming up and and man, there are good friends and partners in ministry in this city and in this, commu- in this area. And so we're praying for Cottonwood in a big way today. Uh, there are things scattered all around. So here's what we're going to do. Some of these things you're praying for you, maybe. And some of them you're praying for somebody else. So you can, go to, you can go to the sin thing and people won't go, yeah, whatever's going on there. Uh, you, may be, you, you can just at least pretend you're praying for somebody else who's struggling in sin, okay? But praying for yourself, you're praying for others. You're praying for, uh, you're praying for your family. And there are any number of ways you can do that. Maybe you're praying for, other, for, for someone, someone else's family that you know is really going through a difficult time right now. Some for you, some for others. That's true for a lot of these stations. But uh, you see where the map is. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to turn you loose to start praying. Now, there's a temptation to say, well, I got the prayer guide. I'm just going to sit here and do this. And, and you can, but I really want to encourage you to go to the station and participate in what's going on at these different spots. Now, I'll tell you this, you can get a little crowded up at some of the places, and so move slowly and deliberately. You don't want to bump anybody, knock anybody down, run over anybody in your uh, enthusiasm about praying today. Take your time. You, this is not, okay, let's have to start. One, two, three. Go to wherever you want to go. Some of you are going to have a deeper burden for certain pieces of this. You've already looked at it and you say, my first three places, I'm going there, there, and there. We're going to have plenty of time to do this. And uh, what I want to encourage you to do, not to talk about praying, but to pray. You can do this individually. You can do this as a couple, a family, uh, as friends. But let's spend this time in prayer. And you can talk. At the stations, there are people. They're going to have a, a lanyard on. That identifies them. That they're, they're the host for that table. They're there to pray with you, for you, but also to explain to you, okay, at this station, here's what we're doing. At this station, here's what we're doing. And also to pray with you, me, other members of our senior staff, we're available and we're all over the building to pray with you in these needs too. But let's make this really count for the Lord. We are going to pray, and there is plenty to cover. This isn't everything there is to know, in the, everything there is to pray about in the whole world, but it's going to cover a lot for us today. So we're going to pray, and we're going to invite you to get up from where you are and go to there. We're going to do this uh, for about the next 25 minutes. So you have plenty of time. Let me pray for us, and then we'll go. Father, Open our hearts to pray. Prompt us by the Holy Spirit to know what to pray, how to pray. And Lord, when we come to the end of ourselves, that you'd intercede for us. Thank you that we have the privilege of gathering as a people for the express purpose of talking to the God of the universe that heaven and earth might start to move in some of the biggest needs around us and in us. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. All right. Begin.
want you to continue doing what you're doing and uh, you can stay as long as you'd like to stay. But I would like just to share this one, one, one set of scriptures as a blessing for us. Thank you for being a part of this. And God's word says, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. And so if, you, if you've completed your prayer cycle, you are dismissed. If you want to continue on, uh, we'll be here for as long as you'd like to stay. God bless you. Have a Christ-filled week.